then there's the, see there's two hicks real hicks who don't pay their bills and then bill hicks who pay their they're always ahead oh, on their mortgage i thought you were gonna say hick posers hick posers there we go but here's the thing okay this is this is what i i'm gonna say all right alex jones if you're listening to this podcast oh my God. please comment um you know uh let us know uh confirm it for us are you bill hicks with a different face <laughs> to say which brings us to oh, Jesus. our actual introduction um welcome to the accelerative thrust i'm dan and i'm eric and this is episode number 50 number do 50 have, do we have any sound effects or anything like i'll add some okay <laughs> <laughs> like i don't know trumpets stuff like that. anyway oh yeah there'll be trumpets all right all right but Trumpets. sounding the seventh <laughs> trumpet but trumpets that sounds good uh so today is the 50th episode extravaganza and when you are all going to be listening to this episode i also figured out that it is going to be thursday november 18th which is exactly one year to the date since eric became my co-host with the milk sprite episode oh, yeah. <laughs> um uh, which was extremely <laughs> low fi by the way i i actually when i fig when i i just to kind of see how far we've come mm -hmm. i uh took a listen to like the first 30 seconds man was it low fi <laughs> I'll tell you, you only what. made it through 30 seconds well yeah i mean i don't i don't sit around and listen to the you know our whole shows really i mean i'm already yeah i already know what's happening it's kind of weird i do listen to um pretty much only our show all the time <laughs> i'm a huge fan like this. so is it you who keeps downloading <laughs> yeah uh, okay. any downloads we've ever gotten are actually just me <laughs> that's as soon as i upload it to the internet i download it again so i can so well, every time I listen to each episode, I download it again. So, okay. Gotcha. Yep. 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 You heard it first. Yeah. Eric, our biggest fan. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of worried. I'm starting to, um, like, I listen to our show so much that I think it's starting to influence how I am on the show. I'm, I've become a parody of myself because of it. I mean, did I, I, I meant a clone. I've become a clone of myself. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a lot of clones in rap music. We can get into that one too. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, there's actually this um, rapper by the name of Kid Boo who claims that he's like a third, second or third generation clone. And he actually references like a company like in Canada that clones like a bunch of rappers. Wow. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. All uh, right, so a year of us being together, working on this show, that's cool. Yeah, that's... um. That's that's really good. And how are we how are we celebrating that? Today? Well, we're gonna celebrate it by talking about hair metal because you know why why not? We're actually it's going to be a really um, unconventional episode, <laughs> which is funny to say because <laughs> we're kind of an unconventional podcast in a way, sort of. Although I think we're getting more conventional as uh, you know. And, and I know yeah. I mean that in that we're finding a format now, but this is going to deviate from everything you know about accelerative thrust, Ooh. erase it from your mind for this episode. We're going to take and it honestly forever anyway, <laughs> forever. <yeah. laughs> Just don't even <laughs> God. Um, if you take gonna... anything from this show, don't don't. Yeah, not at all. No advice. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is we're going to share uh, three of our favorite hair metal albums that we grew up with. I also am going to uh, throw in a couple of um, honorable mentions. I don't know about you. Oh Eric. yeah. I have to. Yes. Um, yes. I, I have to. And in fact, I might even have a couple of like at least one controversial pick because it mm. could even be debated if at least one of my picks could even be considered hair metal, but we'll get oh, to that. Well, well, we can talk about that because that was one of the bigger issues I had as well. Yeah. Yep. Same here. Deal, so same here. Like, I don't know. I picked the mud honey record. Um, 
I picked a um, oh Natalie uh, and Berglia record. Yeah, Natalie yeah. Merchant. Natalie Merchant record. All poss- I mean, they all have hair, and you know, figure. And uh, most of metal. like guitar strings are metal. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So hair metal. You know, that's that's the thing that I that was my criteria. I don't know about any of you guys. Right. Do they, uh, do they use metal to make this music, and do they have hair? Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the criteria right So there. like only right said Fred was exempt. Yeah, right side Fred. And I don't know. I would say maybe the rednecks also, you know, the Cotton Eye Joe. Uh, they had so song. much hair. They, they, all, they did. <laughs> but they there's no way they used metal to make that song. So automatically, you know, because I don't think there were any strings on there. <laughs> So yeah, but anyway, there are two criteria. I'm sorry. Be, before we get too crazy, before I would we get also, to a big old fight about it, a big old fight about whether rednecks could be considered hair metal or not. No, if they uh, could be considered having hair ha- or having hair. Yes. Yeah. Cause okay. that guy did have the hat and the hair. And, uh, anyway. Uh, so um, I just want to remind everybody very quickly that we're on transistor content made right, Spotify, Google, uh, and YouTube to listen to. Now, if you're in a band that isn't an 80s hair metal band, uh, that, uh, well, I mean, if it is an 80s hair metal band and it's you're from Iowa and Illinois, yeah, yeah, you know, you can go ahead and send your stuff to us. And yeah, we could review it and we could and maybe interview you and you know and all that stuff love to hear a little hair metal. Me too. Yeah. I would love to hear like, um, and it would be even better if it was like, like an original hair metal band, like somebody who's updating that style, like, like a steel Panther from like Iowa or something. It's I'm sure it exists. There are some, I know them. I mean, I don't know them. I know of them. Oh really? You know of them? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Bring them on, bring it on, bring Bring them them on. on, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, But if you're in a band, you're from the Iowa, Illinois area and you want your record reviewed or you have any recommendations for any guests or you want to be a guest, you know, let us know, leave a comment on our Facebook or Instagram. Um, also, if you just want to leave a comment and let us know anything, uh, cool shows coming up, uh, any cool scene stuff happening in Iowa or Illinois, let us know. And uh, so we couldn't, uh, you know, go right into our top three hair metal albums without a little hair metal news, could we? Uh No. let's go ahead and start off with the uh tommy lee's wife praises revolutionary fat burning and muscle building device being used by vince sneal if you've seen any youtube video performances or any um uh pictures of vince sneal you can definitely tell he's put on a substantial amount of weight over the years and you know I'm, i'm i hope that his health doing okay or he's you know working to get his health into better shape because i know that there's actually they're hitting the road i think with like poison and deaf leopard or something Hmm. like i think that tour was supposed to happen before covid and it got postponed because of covid um Hmm. so i i don't really know what the deal is but i guess he's using a machine it's supposed to like burn fat it's called the M sculpt. It's Neo. called the treadmill. Yeah, or a treadmill. That would I would think that that would work. Anyway, uh yeah, Tommy <laughs> Lee's wife approves of it. And the thing that's interesting and that this article that I'm reading off of from Metal Sucks points out is that it's kind of weird because that she's like kind of praising it and talking because there's a picture of her right next to Vince Sneal and she looks insanely in shape maybe she just decided to use it for review purposes or whatever so Hmm. that's cool i don't know let's see so one of the things that um one of the controversies about him being this overweight he actually had to stop a a concert like but i think if i remember correctly it was like three or four songs in because he was so out of breath Hmm. um which i mean i can totally understand uh yeah putting on like that much weight so i don't know i mean if it's a push to try and get healthy um yeah i mean they're gonna charge for tickets they got to be able to put on a show so exactly they got to be able to the way uh, it is got to be able to deliver in uh you know capitalism 
capitalism. <laughs> yeah. Learn it, learn it, learn it now. Cause you know, pretty soon those socialists and commies are going to be taken over. And then you'll never see Vince Neil. <laughs> you'll never see Vince Neil. Oh, oh! <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> One thing commies ate. Hair metal. <laughs> mentioning Alex Jones put me in that kind of a mood. <laughs> <laughs> my god i really hope paul stanley goes to hell that is what is coming out of the mouth of paul stanley's sister paul uh, paul stanley <laughs> revealed that his dad passed away at 101 oh and yeah. his older sister julia eisen had this to say about the kiss singer guitarist an opportunistic self-serving bastard and a scumbag who I hope goes to hell because she claims <laughs> that he didn't tell her about the recent death of their father, no. which if that's true, that is pretty, yeah, that's up. not great. Hmm. You know, just to be clear, kiss falls under the category of hair metal automatically when they took their makeup off in the eighties. And uh, hmm. I mean, seriously, crazy. Yeah, I don't know. It's a hair a, metal album. I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> okay, and then in other KISS news, <laughs> Ace Freely says that the Astro World tragedy, uh, the Travis Scott concert, it, I don't know, it says that he's promoting that it was a satanic ritual, which, mm -hmm. to be fair, he's definitely not the only one. <laughs> There's a lot of people that are like, you know, digging into that, uh, I think, a little too far. Now, to be fair, from what I see, it looks to me like he basically just kind of said, I wouldn't be surprised if it you know has something to do with satan now i do believe Wait, that did the, he really say that um i think so i wouldn't I don't be know. surprised I'm... if it was a satanic ritual well hold on a second i certainly me... hope some have anyone would be surprised by something being a satanic ritual it can't be that commonplace in your life right <laughs> this is this is what he says okay our prayers go out to all the families who lost loved ones at the concert. Mm -hmm. Seems like it was a satanic ritual gone very wrong. There'll be hell to pay for everyone who let those kids die. All people of every faith and religion should band together and stop this from ever happening again in America, which is funny because he says all people from every faith and religion, which means the Satanists would have to band together to keep uh, satanic rituals from happening and so, also if it was a satanic ritual that went horribly wrong is a satanic ritual usually a lot of people live and don't die this whole thing this whole thing by the way eric yes i i mean i'm sure you're aware of this this whole thing about whenever like something horrible goes wrong mm -hmm. you could look back at woodstock 99 you could look back at altamont um all the th this is nothing new man like People were saying the same thing about Altamont, that it was some sort of like it was the end. It was a dark age. It was the end of the flower child generation, the hippie movement, and it's ushering in a dark age. And that Altamont was actually a satanic ritual. They hired the Hells Angels and people got stabbed and all this stuff. And of course, the Rolling Stones have been kind of accused of being associated with Satanism. But mm -hmm. so has almost every rock star that's made it big. Um, if you really delve into the world of conspiracy theory, I, this is, this is the thing. Astroworld was terrible and there is a video and I don't think that it was a satanic ritual at all, but I don't know if you've watched any of the videos, Eric, it is no. terrible. Yeah. It, it's a horrible thing. So maybe Ace Freely is kind of coming from that perspective and just throwing satanic ritual on top of it. Just, to, well, yeah. but I, I think, think, I think that's yeah. silly. I think you would it's think Ace Freely would be a little sensitive to, to all that. I mean, he played in a band called Knights in Satan's Service, right? Now, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that was that really the acronym? I don't think they ever said it, but it, everyone said that that's what it meant. They would, yeah, yeah. Everyone Gene was Simmons like, is the demon, like is a demon. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. probably like. I mean, it had to have been one of the first moments of the heavy metal satanic panic. You know, like, I mean, you got your Led Zeppelin and your Black Sabbath. That had kind of gone underground until Kiss, I feel like. I, I feel like they were called Satanists all the time. So you would have to be sensitive to that, right? Or, yeah, or maybe he has inside information. Maybe he is so connected with the devil, he's flat out telling us this was a satanic ritual. I have it on good authority from the devil himself. 
because I worship him or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, could, I don't know. Hey, could then now that's a conspiracy I could get behind. Yeah, he was a star child, so <laughs> no, I Paul mean, Paul Stanley was. Okay, so then what was Ace yeah. Freely then? He was a space ace. Oh, space ace. Okay, yeah, so kind of like the morning star. Is that what Satan's real name is? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right about that. Yeah, so I mean, I think we 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 cracked this wide open. Yeah, but see, the red hot chili peppers claim that. Space might be the final frontier, but it's made in a Hollywood basement. Remember, we went over this the last episode. So Anthony Kiedis is saying that space isn't real. Therefore, hell must not be real. Um, yeah, but he doesn't know the devil. Personally. You don't think Anthony Kiedis knows the devil? Not he made like blood that. sugar sex magic, bro. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why that got me. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, you're right. They, yeah. they, they, they did. I mean, obviously, he flat out worships the devil. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Anthony Keaton and Flea. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I su- I suppose another thing that we should add. This is actually changing the subject completely. I apologize. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> but it's going back to another subject during mm-hmm. the intro, and that is that. We actually, I forgot to add that we actually don't have a local review this episode. Oh, we're we're actually going to be just going over our 80s stuff, Mm -hmm. our 80s hair metal list, which I think now would be a good time to kind of uh, go into that, don't you think? Sure. I mean, we've covered the devil. We've covered space. I think that's all there is, really. I think we're good. We're good. All right. So uh, I was telling dan before we got started that this actually ended up being a lot more difficult than i expected because when we first talked about this episode i was kind of like oh yeah it's a laugh blah 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 and this will be easy because i'll just pick my top three three favorite and they're gonna suck and we'll make fun of them but that's not how it worked out actually after i started listening through a lot of this stuff this music that we've been calling hair metal actually played a pretty big part in my life like for real it was a big part of my life for years and so i kind of had to decide what my actual top three are okay and so that might not make them the best or even the most important or whatever but they are for me what mattered in the moment so i'll start with my first one i'm gonna go in Oh, chronological order because it doesn't okay. really matter okay um, sure, sure but my first one is shout at the devil by motley crew i like motley crew a lot and this one for me um anyone listening to this who's from muscatine and is as old as me or older maybe some younger folks might remember there was this thing called cruising the ones and that was what young people did in downtown Muscatine, they cruised the ones. So second went one direction, third went the other. So you could just do this um, loop the entire night. The streets were lined with awesome cars, Camaros, Broncos, hot ass cars. Every single person had their hair teased. Of course, this is coming through a, um, the eyes and the memory of someone who was uh, eight, years old eight or nine years old i used to go um cruise the ones with a couple of my aunts and my sister and i loved it i absolutely loved everyone there was like just into hair metal everyone all the guys all the girls and they were just cruising and smoking and drinking even as a young kid i was like this is this is what i would like to do for the rest of my life and i i didn't i didn't do that i um in, in fact, after after uh, a, a certain time, I never went and cruised the ones again, and I didn't really listen to hair metal anymore. But for a small moment, it was um, pretty amazing. But Shout at the Devil is so good. It's anthemic as hell. The songs are amazing. Shout at the Devil is awesome. Looks the Kill is unfreaking touchable. Mm-hmm. Um too young to fall in love is so good. Mm-hmm. Um, their cover of Helter Skelter, pretty cool actually. Um, I think it plays to their strengths. I think that Molly Crew really did 
I mean, they they set the tone for all of this, as far as I'm concerned. They're yep. the ones that took Van Halen, made it dangerous, took the the image of new wave of British heavy metal, um, even some of the speed elements of it, you know. So you mix Van Halen and Judas Priest, and you get Molly Crew, and so they they had a lot of blues influence to it. I think Mick Mars is a blues guitar guitarist through and through, even yeah. though he does experiment with some. Uh, dive bombs and squeals and kind of 80s heavy metal guitars on this record but yeah i just think also it really kind of drew a line in the sand between what kind of band you were going to be and unfortunately i don't think they even stuck to the, the the rules that they established here but with shout of the devil it's very um dangerous I, and, and on purpose it's very very dangerous they wanted a big pentagram on the cover they wanted flaming pentagram shooting out of bass drums on the looks that kill video which is one of the best videos ever made um, yes and i just think it encapsulated exactly what needed to be happening right at that moment and on a personal note anytime i hear red hot or looks that kill i'm just transported back to basically 1984 in downtown muscatine which is cool my second choice is uh, look what the cat dragged in by poison mm. the reason is is that i think it marked a moment in this whole thing where they were making the new blueprint molly crew made the first blueprint i think that poison made the second blueprint and that blueprint was used and ruined by so many bands we couldn't you, there's no way you could keep track of it even if it's bands that are slightly well-known warrant slaughter winger all that unfortunately i think poison's responsible for that but in their defense i also think that this was sort of an extension of things i think this was someone taking it to the next level i think they saw like cinderella and things like that and they were like we could do that but let's make it super poppy let's get on pop radio this is not heavy metal anymore it's not glam metal anymore this is hard pop you know it reminds me of like the ultra pop stuff that we hear or like andrew wk yeah this is what it is like this is pop to its extreme with that being said though i think the songs are pretty good um and i don't know i think the excess and the way they did things also like i said is the blueprint for the demise of this entire genre which you have to have that moment in any sort of arc there's you know ground zero there's the thing that marked it as being dead basically there has to be a peak in the middle and to me that's what this is the other reason this made my list is cc deville is one of my favorite guitar players of all time and i'm not even joking i think his sense of melody is better than any other player in this genre i think that especially when he's like, I don't know, like in jazz, they would say comping, which is like the chords and stuff that you're playing during the verses and stuff. If you listen to that, he is so naturally talented and on point. And if you watch live stuff, it's the same way. He's just throwing all this stuff in that is amazing. And his solos are so cool. And, you know, I think that influenced everything that came after it. All of those guys are amazing guitar players. It just kind of sucks. They got trapped in this one style that everyone had to do. Yeah, but I I, I really do love C.C. Deville's guitar playing. I honestly, sometimes when I hear Jay Maskus, I'm like, ah, that dude stole everything from C.C. Deville. And I absolutely mean it. Chronologically and overall, my favorite uh, hair metal record is Appetite for Destruction by Guns mm. N' Roses. Some people might even say that this isn't, but to me, this... Like I, like I said, everything has to have a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And for me, this is the end. This is a group of guys saying, we want to play music like this, but we don't want to do all those things anymore. We don't want to wear makeup like that. We don't want to play pointy guitars. We want to be a rock and roll band. And we're going to do that. It doesn't mean that Axel's not re wearing his hair all teased up in the video, but what it does mean is it's not a joke. These are like real guys playing real music in a real band. And I think it 
came through. I think it blew the whole thing wide open and it could never be repaired. No one could ever go back to being in warrant. You know, it, it just didn't make any sense. But I put this record on a lot. It's got great songs, really great playing. Everyone on it is playing amazingly. It's a totally different attitude from everything that came before it. And it set the tone for the attitude that followed as far as I'm concerned. I don't think you have Alice in Chains without Guns N' Roses. I don't think you have the first Pantera record. It's reach went further. I think it's a result of everything that came before. It's a culmination of that. And it changed everything that came after. You can, I think you could use that analogy from Bauhaus to the first Velvet Underground record. I think it's the same thing. Everything that came before led to that and everything after came from that. Anyway, that's my top three. All right. Well, <clears throat> uh, that's a really, really strong top three there, Eric. <laughs> I mean, for, uh, seriously. Um, in fact, two of my picks matches your picks. Oh, um, no. <laughs> absolutely. Cool. Um, and also one of your picks happens to be an honorable mention of mine. Wow. <laughs> so um, it, uh, it is no secret that we sometimes share similar taste in things. And I think with hair metal, uh, we find a lot of common ground here, Eric. Huh. Wow. Um, so the first one that I'm going to say, I'm going to choose the, uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is the one that Eric didn't pick hmm. um, or that Eric didn't talk about. And that's um, Skid Row's self-titled hmm. debut album, mm -hmm. uh, just titled Skid Row. I think Sebastian Bach is one of the greatest singers Mm -hmm. almost of all time. I love Sebastian Bach's voice. I love the song 18 in life. Mm -hmm. I love youth gone wild, big guns, piece of me. And I also think that like guns and roses, as you mentioned, I kind of think they, it, it's debatable if they could even be a hair metal band in the first place. They kind of came out as that stuff right on the, you know, transitionary period where that stuff was starting to kind of die because 89, I think is when this record came out. Mm -hmm. um, it was still big. I mean, Poison still put out records. I think around that time, I think it was open up and say, ah, uh, mm -hmm. Motley Crue was still putting out stuff like Dr. Feel Good, I think. Um, and Girls, Girls, Girls may have came out around that time as well. Uh, so, I mean, that stuff was still definitely there. Um, but uh, I think anybody who's ever heard their second album, I almost picked their second album, Slave to the Grind, except mm. I really don't think you can count that as a hair metal record at that point. Mm. At that point, I would almost call them almost like, like, a, like a thrash band, but not thrash in the sense of like, Metallica or Megadeth, but they definitely upped the metal and became much heavier on Slave to the Grind. Plus that record came out in 91. So if there mm -hmm. is a record from Skid Row that I would consider a hair metal record or close to a hair metal record, it would be the self-titled record. I also mm -hmm. think Dave the Snake Sabo is an amazing guitar player. And I just think that that record and Slave to the Grind were just full of amazing songs. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a great rock record. And I think they had the almost the exact same attitude as Guns N' Roses, mm -hmm. where they were kind of like, okay, we're going to kind of associate ourselves with this thing, but we're going to play, we're going to be a lot raunchier than that. Mm -hmm. Like you're not, you never really saw Skid Row or Guns N' Roses. You didn't really see, you, you could almost, one of the reasons why you can't really call them hair metal is because they didn't have big hair like yeah. somebody like brett michaels or mm -hmm. whatever so yeah skid row self-titled record i also nice. would highly recommend and this isn't an honorable mention but uh those of you who actually might want to check out any music on this podcast uh their second record slave to the grind is just as strong and i may even like mm -hmm. it better mm -hmm. but i think they're both fantastic but they're both different records mm -hmm. for sure which brings me to my number two pick uh, which is Appetite for Destruction, Guns mm -hmm. and Roses. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm not really doing this in any order. Mm -hmm. I would say this would probably be my favorite album from that time period too. For one thing, mm -hmm. it is one of the best, if not, I would even almost say the best debut album of all time from a mm -hmm. band. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
hands down. There is not one ounce of filler on this record. Mm -hmm. Like every single song is amazing. Welcome to the Jungle, Paradise City, Sweet Child of Mine. We all heard those songs Mm a hundred times. Honestly, songs like Mr. Brownstone, Night Mm -hmm. Train, It's So Easy. All those songs could be, could have been major hits Mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, just like those other songs. Mm -hmm. Rocket Queen. I mean, it's just, it's an amazing record. And what I really like about it is it's pretty raw for like a major label sort Mm -hmm. of like debut. It doesn't feel like it was pre-packaged in any way. It doesn't Mm -hmm. feel like there was a label head behind Guns N' Roses. It really did feel real. You know what I mean? It really did feel like they were. And and I think that this record more than any other record from that time period pushed things forward. I actually would say that this record um, is almost kind of like the beginning, like obviously never mind is what really pushed mainstream music over to like the acceptance of like punk and grunge or mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. I would almost say that this is almost like proto mainstream grunge punk or something Mm -hmm. like it's very i mean there's elements of like almost every single type of rock band all throughout i mean there's parts that almost could remind you of like the ferocity of the stooges or something Mm -hmm. like that um and then there's hair there's there's ballads that are just written amazingly like even to this day if i hear sweet child of mine on the radio I crank it up. It's mm-hmm. such an amazing tune. And that's another thing that I think is really brilliant about this record was it's um, universal appeal. Mm-hmm. My dad loved this record because of Sweet Child of mm-hmm. Mine. And this was in 87. My dad was, you know, he, as far as he was concerned, if it wasn't Led Zeppelin, mm-hmm. if it wasn't to God tier, like say black Sabbath or something, or I don't know, in his eyes, Ted Nugent and things like that. Mm -hmm. It it wasn't shit. These are all just copy bands. Mm -hmm. And he actually recognized for the first time in a band from the eighties, a a band that was actually doing something kind of Mm -hmm. different, something new and something exciting. There was definitely an element of danger to this record that I really, really liked. And I, you know, some of that was, you know, the um, spontaneous behavior of Axl Rose. You could tell that mm-hmm. Axl Rose was like a star. You know, you could tell oh, this, yeah. this dude was going to be a spoiled rock star from the beginning. You know, he was, mm-hmm. there were going to be issues, but Slash, amazing guitar player. Mm-hmm. Duff McKagan, which it makes sense when you actually do the history of Guns N' Roses, it totally makes sense that there's punk elements mm-hmm. to this. Uh, Because Duff McKagan was part of the Northwestern Seattle punk scene back in the 80s. So it stands to reason. And I don't think it's out of line to say that this was almost like the proto version of like, okay, Mm -hmm. in a few years, all of this hair metal shit is just going to be gone. You know what I mean? And and I think Guns N' Roses kind of kind of uh, walked so everybody else could run. You know what I mean? Right. Like, mm-hmm. like, I think that's kind of how, how it worked. Um, and to some people that could be a controversial opinion. Um, but I, I 100% would defend that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then my, I'm going to say that even though appetite for destruction, I think is the best album from this time period. Uh, I have such a special place in my heart for my third pick, which is look what the cat dragged in by poison Mm -hmm. to me the even though motley crew and i agree with you that motley crew set the the standard for everything this this whole hair metal thing Mm -hmm. it all started with motley crew i still think of poison and this has to do with the age i think that i was Mm -hmm. when this record came out poison is to me the ultimate hair metal Mm -hmm. but when i think of hair metal I ultimately think of poison from, from the neon like logo, Mm -hmm. which I think is honestly one of the best and most iconic logos in rock music. Like I'm not Mm -hmm. kidding. And when they played live, it lit up and it was just Mm -hmm. amazing. There was all of these pyrotechnics. Um, Like you said, CC DeVille 
brilliant guitar player Mm -hmm. um almost punk in a lot of his deliveries Mm -hmm. on look what the cat dragged in and that's kind of the thing about a lot of these hair metal bands they kind of started out sort of raw and dirty i mean Mm -hmm. poison i think definitely did have label support behind them okay let's dig into the songs here man Mm -hmm. cry tough the opening track is one of the most self-help like yeah. songs I've ever heard. And it's so interesting to think of it. Like they're, ba- it's, they're singing about struggle, basically, I think mm-hmm. that they were probably going through just to get signed, which I mean, you know, that might sound kind of cheesy, but you know, you got to cry tough out on the streets to make your dreams happen. It's you know, it's an like Andrew WK song. <laughs> it is. It's, and then, it goes into I want action, mm-hmm. which we all know what that's about. But here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing is it's I about wanna... liking uh, Sylvester Stallone movies. There you go. I want action, 80s action movies. <laughs> here's the thing. This is this is kind of, and this is another controversial, potential controversial opinion. Mm-hmm. In a lot of ways, I almost think that culturally, and when you're talking about Guns and Roses, and you know, I I sometimes like to compare the eighties and nineties. Mm-hmm. So I'm totally going to do that. I already did it with the guns and roses and guns and roses were like the Nirvana of the eighties kind mm-hmm. of not, I don't think they had near the cultural impact that Nirvana ended up having. Right. But I would venture to say poison is like the green day of the eighties. Mm. I actually hear a lot of yeah green day in like, I want action is a very like, if you actually listen to uh, certain songs by mm-hmm. Green Day, uh, it has that boogie, that shuffle, that Green Day is actually, I mean, what take a song like Longview, mm-hmm. you know, and then put it side by side with I Want Action. Yeah. And you tell me that there isn't some inspiration going on. Maybe there wasn't. I don't know. I mean, Green Day, like, mm-hmm. comes from the punk scene, but, you know, what this... Yeah, but record- everyone's drawn from the same thing. You know, it's like... Yeah. They were probably both uh, influenced by the Bay City Rollers or whatever. You know Exactly. Like, yeah. And at the end of the day, Green Day and Poison are both really strong power pop bands in mm-hmm. a way. Right. And that's exactly what Look What the Cat Dragged In mm-hmm. is to me, is just really good power pop with a really good uh, ballad thrown in. I Won't Forget You. And yeah, it is good. <laughs> it's a great ballad. And then the song Look What the Cat Dragged In is mm-hmm. one of the most punk things. Like, I don't care what anyone says. Solid. I love, love mm-hmm. that song. Talk Dirty to Me, one of the greatest garage rock riffs ever. Yeah. Um, everything about this band is so iconic to me. Mm-hmm. I have to say, they were my second musical obsession, too, by the way. Nice. Um, Huey Lewis in the News. 85 was my first one. I love the sports record. And then Poison became my favorite band for at least a year. Then it became Iron Maiden. And -hmm. then once the 90s set in, it became Nirvana. But anyway, yeah, this record is so good. I don't care what anyone says. Now, is it a masterpiece? You know, I wouldn't say that, but it's it doesn't need to be. It's not supposed to be. No. It's supposed to be really good, fun rock with a, right. a self-help song starting the record off. Yeah. It's really, really good. And Cry Tough has some of the best lyrics ever. It's a and great opener and it's a great introduction to their band. Great opener. What a great debut. So anyway. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny because I think something that keeps coming up as we talk about this is how different all of this can be. And yeah. that's sort of the trouble I ran into when I was working on this on stuff for this week show was like, okay, fine. Where the hell does wasp fit in? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they are hair metal without a doubt, but they're super scary. I mean, for yeah. that time, like they're like venom playing hair metal. Right. And so Pretty much, and then you have, like kind of in betweeners, you know, like we were talking about Kiss, like an Ozzy, like the first Ozzy records have to be considered hair metal, right? And you also have to consider what Alice Cooper was doing around right. that time. Exactly. And so 
you get into a lot of different things and you, you start to think about, oh, what constitutes? Because like at the end of the day, Bon Jovi is probably the biggest fan of this whole thing. But I don't Absolutely. even like consider him in the same realm. Right. I'm not saying Poison obviously is like super legit and Bon Jovi are posers. Like that doesn't even make sense to say out loud. No. <laughs> but in my mind, it feels that way. You know what I mean? And yeah, so absolutely. you get into this thing where it's like, like the first Alice in Chains record, like Man in the Box obviously is something different, but the rest of that record, I don't know. You could put one of those songs on on one of these records and, and no one would really bat an eye. They wouldn't be like, oh man, this is really pushing the envelope. I think grunge you know? and hair metal were a lot closer than people really I absolutely think. agree. I think that- I even Clothing Pearl had the most to do with it. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Even Pearl Jam's first album, 10, mm -hmm. for all of its depressive nature that it was, right. it was an overproduced rock record. <laughs> just, you know what I mean? Just oh, like, yeah. I mean, it Absolutely. was, it had schlock rock production. The real thing yeah. by Faith No More. Totally. There's so many like elements to this whole thing. But yeah, um, I just think it's really interesting. And I think it's, I think the, the the part of it that sucks for me as a music fan is that I don't think all this shit should be lumped together. I think a lot of these bands had really cool individual sounds and I agree approaches. And unfortunately people say hair metal and us included, we're as guilty, like the whole impetus for this, episode is us being like let's do a stupid hair metal episode like but at the end of the day it really is dismissive of a lot of it really is um, good stuff you it's know? the same thing with it's the same exact thing with grunge too like in the right. 90s it's like yep. pearl jam alice in chains soundgarden and nirvana those are like the big four of mm -hmm. you know like the grunge movement or whatever and they all sound different from one another. And, uh, you know, they all came from different backgrounds. They all mm -hmm. definitely, you know, but it's like, yeah, no, I totally like poison is so different from guns and roses and guns and roses. Yeah. Is so different from Cinderella and oh, Cinderella, yeah. you know, it's just, yeah, definitely one of those things. Oh so. man. I love the guy from Cinderella's voice. That is He's, one of the he, best voices. Oh, my I'm God. not too familiar with like their catalog, but I love that one song. Nobody's fool. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's on uh, night songs. Night mm -hmm. songs is really solid. It's good. Yeah. Um, I may have to look into that. So, I, I mean, for me, it's the guy's voice. That's what sells it. It sure. has a, it has a edge to it that other people don't. Even though I think his voice honestly became sort of the template for most of the cheesy, what I consider made up hair metal, yeah. like stuff that's not real, like the fast way songs on the movie Trick or Treat soundtrack. Like, sure, if someone was gonna act like a hair metal band, that's the voice they would do. But it it it's a killer voice. I love yeah, it. Yeah. So, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. That Cinderella so, kind of rips. That's all. Yeah. Hey, yeah, no, I love that. I, I love that um, song. Yeah. But I can uh do my honorable mentions real quick too. There we go. If you want. Um Let's so do that. it's weird to call these honorable mentions. And the reason is is because this might actually be my top three. That's how I kind of feel about <laughs> the mine problem too. is is that these records didn't quite have the impact on my life personally. And that, you know, and that's why they have been delegated down to honorable mentions versus my top three. Sure. And the funny thing is they sort of mirror my top three. Like they're sort of like the thing that you know is the best thing. And then you have the thing that you actually really enjoy the most. Right. You right. know what I'm saying? So I'll just go through them real quick and I'll do it chronologically because like I said, they're sort of parallels to the other records. Sure. And I'll mention my other ones so that we can see those parallels. The sure. first one is Too Fast for Love by mm. Motley Crue. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like I said, Shout at the Devil meant more to me in my life. And it meant, uh, I think overall, a little more to the entire music industry. I don't think Too Fast for Love had the impact of yeah. shout at the devil 
but too fast for love rules and more than uh shout at the devil it really is musically the template for what became hair metal you have every kind of song on here uh you have pretty good ballads um but also just like a tough attitude like this is to me this is someone going i like van halen but i don't want to have fun and that i mean and that's what it, they did i think livewire is sick just one of the best songs i do think that i don't know it, the the production is not great if you don't believe me just listen to when the drums come in on um on with the show on with the show which oh is oh my god it's such a great song such an amazing and song and then tommy lee's drums come in and just like boom boom boom, boom like he, yeah yeah oh, very insane. Insane. and then he does this reggae beat through the second verse it's like yeah, the yeah, loudest yeah. thing i've ever heard anyway um i love that song though now Absolutely. to be fair they recorded that album when they literally yeah. almost had next to nothing no money they did it themselves it was independently yeah. released before mm-hmm. a label picked them up yeah it was on leather records yeah with an umlaut a, a u in the word leather and an umlaut <laughs> that's crazy uh, the other thing too i don't think it was any small coincidence that the cover looks just like sticky fingers i think that oh yeah, yeah i think I that mick that. mars is a blues guitarist like i said mm-hmm. and that's going to be something i mentioned with my next pick too is a lot of these guys are coming out of this from being in bar bands from sure. being a rock and roll band even sure. maybe even being a, a glam band but it's not glam metal that's a new thing sure. so that's important to keep in mind sure. um but too fast for love I I adore it. I I put it on often. So probably more than Shout at the Devil. Um, My second one is Stay Hungry by Twisted Sister. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, This is probably for me, the biggest experience I had with a record, like how you talked about Poison, that was Stay Hungry for me. It was life defining for me. It really was. It was like, this is it. This is where I belong. These are the people. These are my people. With that being said, yeah, I put it on. I love almost every song. The hits, I'm not that as into. You know, we're not going to take it. And I Want to Rock are not that interesting of songs. As a little kid, I think I responded to them more than the other songs. But now I'm like, those are kind of throwaway. But the rest of this record is like dark, really dark. You're going to hell and... Captain Howdy, who's, you know, the devil and the exorcist, but he's presented almost like as a, I don't want to say a pedophile, but someone that's way too interested in kids. Right. And the whole thing is just like misanthropic. It's like, it it just has a darkness to it. And I think that comes from the Alice Cooper influence. I think that can't be overstated, the influence of Alice Cooper on this entire thing. You sure. Know? Because they are playing glam rock, but they were darker and they did have a more uh, hard rock sound to it than like Slade, you know? And so I, I think you have a lot of these older dudes coming out of that situation, trying to get into the hair metal. And I think that's where stay hungry is. I think it, I think the guitar playing on it is good for a bar band. I don't think it has, I don't, it's not even like the same instrument when you get into like CC DeVille. So Anyway, uh, I love Stay Hungry. I think it's really a lot of fun. I think, it, and it's funny though, and I'm sorry to keep going off of, about this record, but at the end of We're Not Gonna Take It, you have D. Snyder, who also has one of my favorite vo- voices of all time. Like mm-hmm. one of the reasons I got way into big business is because I thought the sound, the singer sounded just like D. Snyder. Yeah, he really does No too. joke. But yeah, so at the end, he's doing dialogue from animal house yeah now, <laughs> a pledge pin on your <laughs> uniform you know like that's not to young people in 1984 right i'm sorry it's just not like it wasn't then it's not now like that's an old guy thing like they you know they should have written songs about fletch or some shit like it just wasn't I don't know. It was old guys making music for young people. And I think it comes through. So uh, the parallel for that one, I think probably is poison, but a direct parallel 
for me to Appetite for Destruction brings me to, I mean, it has to be my favorite. I listen to it all the time. Self-titled Faster Pussycat. It is okay. unbelievable how good it is. I can't even talk about it. It's not hair metal. It's rock and roll. It's Chuck Berry rock and roll. Like it's boogie woogie and it's sleazy and it's super fun. I like the guitar playing. Like I said, it's basically like Chuck Berry, which is totally insane. I just, I don't know. No Room for Emotion is a killer song. Bathroom Wall is amazing. Yeah, I kind of think of Faster Pussycat like Motorhead, but without distortion and with maybe like uh, Schmeagle singing, the Gollum singing. Like, yeah. What's that dude's name? Tay Downs from Faster Pussycat. Anyway, one of my favorite vocalists ever. I mean, he sounds like Gollum. It's it's unbelievable. Like, I'll do a little impression. This is my impression, okay? All right. <laughs> Let me try bathroom wall. Uh, they sing, uh, I got your number off the bathroom wall. And then he says, And I decided it was about time to make the call. <laughs> okay, yeah. You know what? I have to admit, I'm not really, I can't, oh, I don't think man. I've ever really listened to Faster Pussycat. Yeah. Give that self-titled one a, a chance. Cause I I can't say enough about it. I put it on way too often. I mean, wow. I just love it. It really does. It feels like listening to Motorhead w- to me, but more fun. So, wow. How about you? Um, Honorable okay. mentions. So I'm going to start off with, um, Actually, you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned them uh, as this is definitely one that musically you could definitely debate if they are uh, hair metal or not. But it's actually Wasp self-titled record. Oh yeah, love this record. Uh, tough. The whole um, animal fuck like a beast mm-hmm. story is great. That automatically makes them badass. Uh, yeah. Which they ended up putting that on later repressings as the first uh, track as it should have been right because it was meant to be the first track but then mm-hmm. the record company made them take it off but i want to be somebody mm-hmm. i mean the record is yeah straight up it's it's basically like old school what some people call proto black metal like venom mm-hmm. and the thing is blackie lawless is more terrifying than pretty much any of them (laughs) if you actually really think about like what he's actually done like on stage wasp Mm -hmm. have actually done a lot of crazy shit Mm -hmm. like theatrically on stage he put out an wasp put out like an industrial album in the 90s wow and i guess that he actually like cut like a pig like on stage and there was actually like blood and guts and everything like, you know, but yeah, no Blackie Lawless. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I read an article where it was like the stuff that Wasp was doing. And I I remember reading this in some publication back in the late nineties or whatever made Marilyn Manson look like, you know, like, like a children's show basically, you know? And it turns out that I think Manson, um, there was some controversy. I don't remember what it was, but I think Black and Lawless kind of thought that Manson ripped him off anyway, which hmm. well, I mean, come on, man. Like Black, then who did Blackie Lawless rip off? You know, I mean just D Snyder. <laughs> just D Snyder. And <laughs> no, they they're they're parallel. I, I mean, I come on, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure he listened to Venom a few times. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure that he probably listened to Alice Cooper a few times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. But uh, and I don't so know I, where they're from. Are they from the st- Drip? Are they from oh, California? Because honestly, Wasp no. came across to me as, you know, we want to play hair metal, and but wait, who's the oh Slayer? Okay, well let's try to mix those things. Even yeah, let you exactly. Like it's exactly not enjoyable guitar playing. It's like scary. Yeah, it's very like heavy, and yeah. at times it's very punk rock. Like yeah, it's very like sure it is. in your face, and yeah, it's but it's anthemic as hell. I mean. Mm-hmm animal fuck like a beast and like i'll tell you what man blackie lawless has some pipes oh yeah and absolutely he has, he does. i i have a lot of respect for uh blackie lawless uh maybe for not killing a pig on stage but <laughs> like you know uh for other things that i, I think he's totally underrated mm-hmm. wasp doesn't really get 
mentioned in the and conversation. I think it's because they don't fit in very well. Yeah, they don't fit in very well. Uh, yeah. So the second pick, and this is kind of like, a, I really liked this album when I was like seven or eight. And I would go over to a friend's house and he had this tape and mm-hmm. we would listen to it all the time. This is another band that I don't think really gets talked about a lot. And that's Dokken. Um, mm-hmm. The album Breaking the Chains. I really like this album. Mm-hmm. I think it's... um. It's very melodic, but also I think Dokken are a little bit heavier than mm-hmm. not necessarily this album, but future albums. Uh, I could definitely hear some priest influence kind of coming in. Um, and uh, they, I think they were a little bit heavier than what a lot of people give them credit for. Um, yeah, at least in the beginning, for sure. In the beginning, yeah. And I think Breaking the Chains is just a superb melodic track. And I think uh future albums too like under lock and key like that song in my dreams is so infectious just the mm-hmm. melody or off of nightmare on elm street three dream warrior come on oh, yeah. man yeah. um but this album in particular is the one that i remember listening to over and over again as a kid i have to revisit it again though because mm-hmm. I uh, I haven't really revisited it, and I'm sure mm. that I would like it. I remember all these songs uh, in right. the middle, Seven Thunders, and you know stuff like that. But um, I may just have to revisit it again one of these days. But I would definitely call uh, if for no other reason than the fact that I just feel Dokken doesn't get mentioned mm-hmm. as much as I think they should. Mm. Um, I think this is a great record, and then my number one. Um, uh, honorable mention is shout at the devil. I oh, mean, yeah. nice. I, I almost put it on my top three list, which would have mm-hmm. been hilarious because right. then I would have had literally the same top three list as you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, that almost happened, Eric. Wow. Crazy. Uh, shout at the devil is just a masterpiece, man. Mm-hmm. It's so raw and punk rock and in your, and so is too fast for love. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, agree with you i think mick mars at heart is a blues guitarist um i definitely agree with you on uh well first of all shout at the devil itself mm-hmm. is such a killer track oh and the yeah it imagery is. the the imagery <laughs> the imagery of this uh, album yeah. is so like i mean when i look at it i salivate it's so mm-hmm. like and they look like they live underground and some like like they look like the punks from escape from New York or something, Sure, you know, and, yeah. and they're just carrying torches and probably into like satanic rituals and oh, yeah. things like that. And they're shouting at the devil. I mean, they're actually talking to him, you know, right? it's <laughs> just like crazy. Ace Freely does, but yeah. looks that kill. Oh, that oh, looks like kill is so good. That drum part. Yeah. Where the guitar and drums both kind of do this like little like oh yeah you know and I mean? then and it gets almost like epic classical for a second too the yeah, yeah. oh my god and like yeah it's such these are people that i would not yeah. want to associate with i would be scared <laughs> of them they're like keeping people in cages or something down yeah. there like like it's almost a speed metal song yeah, it really is. I mean, yeah. this is almost a speed metal album. It almost is. They definitely got I mean, heavier for Shout at the Devil. I mean, I think, I think, I think though that precedent was set on Too Fast for Love with mm-hmm. Livewire, though. I do too. But they I were mean, way less fun on Shout at the Devil. Way less fun. Um yeah. I think Livewire was they're like, okay, this is what we want to be. And mm-hmm. yeah, the rest of this record's pretty good. Yeah. But Let's not write songs that the Get Up Kids are going to cover in the future. <laughs> yeah. Because have you heard the Get Up Kids version of On With The Show? Oh, no, I haven't. Mm-mm. It's actually better than, dare I say it, the the original. Mm. Like, in my opinion. I don't know. I mean, I'll listen I'm just, to I'm, it. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, just, I'm, that's dude, a hard dude, one. <laughs> I'm 100%. I'm 100% kidding. Oh, good. Um, I do think it's a great cover, though. <laughs> I, think it is, I think it's a great cover. Uh, um, I love how hard Tommy Lee hits, though. When I was oh, making yeah, fun of his fantastic. drums, I, it's because he can't not play that hard. They couldn't have turned him down enough. They would have just not been able to play on that song. Sure. Like, he's a hard hitter, and it's awesome, especially on Shout at the Devil. Sure. 
And, Sorry. Um, Sorry to no, hijack your pick. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> I, I just I've, love I've, it so much. <laughs> I've hijacked, dude, we're so passionate about this subject. I feel that we have to hijack each other when they're talking. God, so man. freaking good. It's, yeah. I wonder if they ever play those songs now. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, why you want to go see them? I, you around? know, if, if, if they did shout at the devil in its entirety in 2021, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe not. If Vince Neil, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> like, if they played exactly what I wanted to hear, I still yeah. would not go. I mean, that's how I am with shows anymore, Eric. <laughs> I want to go, but I don't. I'm not going unless Vince Neil drops like 20 pounds. I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. You better find some machine or something to fix that. <laughs> like, let's give him some sort of machine. <laughs> Like I heard that machines are starting to serve French fries at fast food restaurants. Now we got machines that serve you French fries and machines that get you in shape. This yeah, is both bullshit. Of them. Yeah. Pick one AI. <laughs> Come on. Artificial intelligence. I thought you were intelligent. <laughs> All we got to do is keep them fat and striving not to be <laughs> fat. That'll consume uh, pretty much all of their intentions for the rest and, of their lives. And then when they get too sad about it, we'll make a machine that gets them in shape. <laughs> so Eric, are there any cool uh, hair metal uh, shows coming to Iowa? Actually, I did include something on our, um, our list here. There aren't very many shows this week. There just aren't. Um, but I'll tell you the ones that I know about. So on Friday, the 19th tomorrow, we have Anna Libera with American Cream. That is at XBK Live in Des Moines. On Saturday, the old 20th, um, Stephanie Catlett, who's a singer or songwriter from Iowa City, is playing, um, also is playing Sam Drella and Dave Helmer from Crystal City. So that's at the Sanctuary Pub on Saturday. We also have The Shining Realm, who we've Ooh, talked about yeah. on here, which is awesome, with uh, a group, Psych Blues rock group, Louisiana Drifter, and a special set from Lou Sherry. Hmm. Um, and that is at Gabe's. That is Saturday the 20th. Um, we also have at The Octopus, The Rumors. So they are kind of like a, a pop, hard rock, sleaze kind of group um and so that does i think falls into the hair metal category slightly okay cool um so the rumors uh in my blood eight found dead and nubby all of them seem to be in this rock and roll hard rock vein so while we're on the subject you know might as well go to the octopus and check that out um, sure the 20th saturday and then on sunday the 21st at gabe's oasis in iowa city we have tv cop and Penny Peach, uh, Blissed Her, and The Good Habits. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so that should be pretty awesome. That's Sunday the 21st. That's all I have. So not a ton of shows, but some good stuff. Um, I mean, it is getting into the winter time. Shows are going to slow down, and that's just kind of the way it is. I was hoping after you know we all could go outside again, the season wouldn't matter that much, but let's be honest, moving amps up the stairs at Gabe's in the snow sucks. So I get it if there's not much going on, but if there is something going on and I don't know about it, let me know. If you have a show you want other people to know about it, super easy, just send us a message and I will include it. I'm including stuff that even just sounds interesting. I don't even know some of these bands. So mm -hmm. it's not like, Oh, they won't say it or whatever. No, if you send it to me, it'll be on the on the calendar. <laughs> so, yeah, sure, yeah. So that's what's happening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for our fiftieth anniversary episode. 50th it was a anniversary. Yeah, fiftieth. I'm not that old. <laughs> our fiftieth episode anniversary. Yeah, there we I'm go. Fiftieth fiftieth episode celebration. Yeah, know. yeah, episode celebration. No, let's I just stick with 50th anniversary. Yeah. Thank you well, all like for it. being <laughs> really good uh podcast listeners. I, I appreciate yeah. all of you for that. Uh since uh Eric climbed on board, the audio has gotten exceedingly better. The editing has gotten exceedingly better. And uh this is a serious moment, Eric. I do want to say uh, I 
appreciate the fact that you're still sticking with me, uh, even during my, uh, nonsensical, not knowing how to edit, (laughs) but I really do appreciate having you as the co-host and I'm to this day, I I don't think I could have asked a better co-host. So thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, Um, Thank you for having me. It's, uh, been a lot of fun. It means a lot to me to be able to find new music and maybe be able to share that with other people who want to find new music, but don't necessarily know where to start or whatever. So I think it's a, it's a service that I would respond to if I weren't the one providing it, you know what I mean? Like, right. And that's how you should do everything in life. May create the things that you want to see or hear or be a part of. And exactly. That, that's what we do. So, and so that, thanks again. And also I want to give a shout out to the listeners. Um, Eric and I both see the stats. And so we, you know, uh, anybody who's ever downloaded an episode, we totally appreciate that. Um, everybody who's giving us feedback, everybody that we know who's listening. Um, so mm-hmm. you'll be hearing, uh, the next serious moment on this podcast will be episode 100. So yeah. you'll have to wait. You'll have to wait a little bit. Actually, now we'll probably do a serious moment on episode 75 also. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> episode 100 will be about the future because it'll be in the future. So, yeah. Wow. Future music. Future music. Future music reviews. All right. So, thanks, everybody, for listening. I hope yeah. you all have a good and wonderful week. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. In a lot of ways. I really hope Paul Stanley goes to hell. I don't want to have fun.